us for that. And now, a big welcome, please, for Thomas Friedman. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a treat to be here. Um, is the mic not on? Hear me now? Great. Thank you. Um, it's a treat to be here, David. Thank you very much. David's father, Tony Lewis, was a great mentor and friend of mine. It's an honor to be introduced by him. This is going to be really cool. I can't wait. Do I get a, do I get a copy of that when it's done? Okay. That's great. Um, you know, ostensibly, I'm going to be talking about uh, stuff from my last book, That Used to Be Us, How America Lost Its Way and the World It Invented, and How We Can Come Back. Um, I know some of you have read it. Those of you who haven't, I know who you are. Um, <laughs> know where you hang out. Um, you know, whenever myself and my co-author on that book, uh, Professor Michael Mandelbaum of Johns Hopkins University, whenever we went out and talked about it, you know, we told people the title of our book, That Used to Be Us, How America Lost Its Way in the World It Invented, and How We Can Come Back. The first question we got from people always was, but, but, but does it have a happy ending? And we told everybody it does. We just don't know yet whether it's fiction or nonfiction. <laughs> We're still working on that. That's a lot about what I'm going to talk about today. And I know making it nonfiction is really at the center of your endeavor here in Atlanta. So how did two foreign policy geeks, I'm the foreign affairs columnist at the New York Times, technically my colleague Michael Mandelbaum is a chair professor of international relations at Johns Hopkins, how did two foreign policy geeks end up writing a book about domestic American politics? It's very simple, we're neighbors and old friends, have been for 20 years, we talk every morning, and we started to notice something over the last four or five years, that is we'd start every day talking about the world, but we'd end every day talking about America. And it became obvious to us that America, its fate, future, vigor, and vitality, was actually the biggest foreign policy issue in the world. Because uh, Michael and I are kind of old-fashioned American nationalists. That is, we believe America makes more than its share of mistakes in the world. We do some really dumb things sometimes. But on balance, we think America provides a huge number of global public goods, whether it's trying to defend the principle of the non-use of poison gas in Syria, or supporting international institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, and the United Nations, or patrolling the sea lanes in the Pacific. We provide a huge number of global public goods. And if we go weak as a country, your kids won't just grow up in a different Atlanta, in a different Georgia, in a different America. They will grow up in a fundamentally different world. A world ordered by Russia or by China, or most likely by nobody at all. So there's something huge at stake in this thing we call the American dream and our ability to pass it on to another generation. Now, if I were to summarize in one sentence what's at stake, it really comes from this amazing 1958 Orson Welles movie. There's a wonderful scene in there that really captures it all for me. The movie is Touch of Evil. It's a movie about murder, kidnapping, conspiracy, and corruption in a town on the Mexican-American border. Orson Welles, you'll recall, plays a crooked cop who tries to frame his Mexican counterpart for a murder. At one point, Welles stumbles into a brothel and finds the proprietor, Marlene Dietrich, who is also a fortune teller with cards spread out in front of her. Read my future for me, Wells says. You haven't got any, she replies. Your future is all used up. Is that us? Is that America? Is our future all used up? Well, we don't think so. We don't think so at all. That's why we wrote this book. But what we do believe is that we're not going to win the 21st century. We're not going to thrive in the 21st century by default. We've got to get our act together. And that's what I know really inspired this collaboration conference. And so what I want to talk about today 
is why and how we do that. Because the underlying theme of my last book and maybe my next one is that we're all on a journey now. We're all on a huge journey because something really big happened these last 10 years that's opened up a huge gap in where we are in education and where we need to be, in where we are in business and where we need to be, in where we are as cities and where we need to be. And we all, we all now sense this. We all now intuit it that we all need to get on a journey. We don't even quite know where the end is yet. So let's talk about why. Why are you here today? What is it you intuited? Well, I think when historians look back at the early part of the 21st century, this moment we're in right now, and they ask the question, what was the most important thing to happen in the early 21st century? What will they say? Will they say it was 9-11? Some people will, when you look at how we contorted our whole society in response to it. Will they say it was the subprime crisis? Some people will, when you look at the impact that's had around the world. Will they say it was the breakup of Brad and Jen or the marriage of William and Kate? I mean, <laughs> what will they say? Well, I would argue they're going to say none of those. They're going to say that the biggest thing that happened, the thing that affected more other things, that affected more institutions and schools and businesses and communities, than anything else was the merger of globalization and the IT revolution. The merger of globalization and the IT revolution in a way that took the world from connected to hyper-connected and from interconnected to interdependent. Those are two huge changes. And the reality of them is why we're all on a journey now. So what do, I, what do I mean by from connected to hyper-connected? Well, I know a little bit about this subject because back in 2004, I wrote a book called The World is Flat. And that book argued basically four things, four simple things. It argued that the world was getting connected because of the convergence of four technologies. The first was the PC, the personal computer. And what the PC allowed was for the first time in the history of mankind for individuals, individuals, to author their own content in digital form. Now, individuals have been authoring their own content ever since cavemen and cavewomen etched on cave walls. But with the PC, for the first time, you, me, our kids, individuals, could create content in digital form, in the form of bits and bytes, words, photo, data, spreadsheets, video, music. That then converged very quickly with another huge invention, this thing called the internet, which suddenly meant I could not only author my own content in digital form, I could send it anywhere in the world virtually for free. And that converged with another huge innovation, which I called workflow software, which was software that allowed me to collaborate, collaborate on my digital content with your digital content, words, photo, data, spreadsheets, music, video, no matter where we were in the world. And that quickly converged with a fourth innovation called search, named Google, which allowed us all to search each other's content and enhance collaboration. All four of those things happened in the space of about 15 years, right around the year 2000. And I ar argued that what they did was to create a platform where suddenly more people could compete, connect, and collaborate with more other people in more other places with greater efficiencies to do more things for less money than ever before. Hence, I declared, the world is flat. Had I been a more honest man, I would have said the world is flattening. Book would not have sold 4.5 million copies, okay? <laughs> because that first platform really just applied to about a billion people. 
But I, I had an intuition where it was going. And I think that intuition has been borne out. Because in 2011, I sat down with my friend Michael to write That Used to Be Us. And the first thing I did when I sat down to write this book was to go back to the first edition of The World is Flat, which I started in 2004, just to remind myself, what did I say? I got it down from the bookshelf. I cracked it open to the index. I looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, F, A. Facebook wasn't in it. So when I was running around saying, the world is flat, we're all connected. Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was still in the sky. 4G was a parking place. LinkedIn was a prison. Applications were what you sent to college. Big data was a rap star. And Skype was a typo. Okay? All right? So... I love doing that. Can I do that again, really? Just uh, okay. All of that happened, friends, after I wrote The World is Flat in seven years. So think about that. And what that did was in seven years, all disguised by 9-11 and the subprime crisis, because that's what we were looking at, underneath the world's plumbing fundamentally changed. The world's technological plumbing. Why? Well, let's go back to those four things that made the world flat. The ability for people to author their own content went from the PC to this. This and the tablet and the 3D printer. This, the tablet and the 3D printer connected to the cloud, which gave me exponential more ability to create content with the world's most powerful tools rented from the cloud for nickels and dimes. My ability to send my content went to high-speed broadband and wireless. So I could suddenly send so much more content from so many more places, even mobily. My ability to collaborate went from you know, this uh, little thing, you know, we, we had earlier of just people, you know, talking to one another through workflow software. My ability to collaborate exploded with Facebook, Twitter, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding like Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Suddenly, my ability to collaborate, not only just with other people, but on funding and innovation and so many more things, just exploded. And lastly, my ability to search went from Google to big data. Suddenly I could search down to the finest granules and adjust my business accordingly. So everything that had made the world flat suddenly exploded and it took the world from connected to hyper-connected and from interconnected to interdependent. And it all happened in the last seven years while you were worrying about your mortgage and waiting in the TSA line at the airport for 9-11, okay? Now, the net effect of it, the net effect of it, I would say, is that all these new technologies together are super empowering, super empowering individuals to do good and ill, to be makers or breakers, and they are radically changing the cost of how things are done or the way things are done or the things that can be done. To put it differently, it's speeding up everything. The small can get bigger faster. The big can get smarter faster. The new can emerge faster. The expensive can get cheaper faster. We all have to adapt faster. And the slow get killed faster. It's changing every job, every workplace, every school, and impacting both politics and geopolitics in unpredictable ways. You're all living it. You're all feeling it. It's one of the reasons you're here today. But nobody's explained it to you. Not at the national level, let alone giving you a map to navigate forward. So let's try to do a little of that today. First of all, what are the signs that this is 
happening, that we've gone from connected to hyper-connected. Let me give you a few, okay? Because I travel around the world a lot, I get to read a lot of local papers, love to read local papers. You find little interesting stories in every local paper. October 30th, I'm in New Delhi, October 30th, 2010, and the Hindustan Times that morning, I saw, ran a small item on their front page. It reported that a Nepali, a Nepali telecommunications firm had just started providing third-generation 3G mobile service at the summit of Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. The story said this would, quote, allow thousands of climbers and trekkers who throng the region every year access to high-speed internet and video calls using their mobile phones. Do you know how many phone calls are being made from the top of Mount Everest today <laughs> that begin, Mom, you'll never guess where I'm calling you from. <laughs> That's from connected to hyper-connected. Here's another example. I was in San Francisco in May, speaking at the New School Summit. Some of you were there, great meeting. And um, I had rented a Hertz car. And in the middle of the summit, I had to change all my plans. When I was going back, where I was going back, where I dropped off the car, when I dropped off the car, no problem. I called Hertz, 1-800-HERTZ. Got the automated voice on the line. Just give me your reservation number. And then I expected it to say, and remain on the line, and a Hertz service representative will be with you shortly. This call is being recorded for quality purposes. <laughs> I never got the Hertz representative. I did the entire complex transaction entirely with artificial intelligence. Note to your kids, you may not want to think about being a Hertz service representative <laughs> when you grow up. A few weeks later, I'm back in Minneapolis with some of my old friends, Jill and Ken Greer, and they just had a terrible hailstorm. Terrible hailstorm. And Jill tells me they had all kinds of damage to their roof, so they called the insurance agent to come out. And uh, Allstate, Allstate, came out to their house in Edina, and Jill said, uh, well, we had this hailstorm, and this is what it was, and, uh, you know, here's the ladder, and you can go up on the roof and check. He said, we didn't have to check. We already saw it by satellite. Maybe you don't ah, want to be the Allstate guy anymore who goes up on the roof. Um, that job is going away. No problem. I was um, in Yemen doing a documentary this spring on uh, climate change in the, Arab, in the Arab, sp Arab Spring, which is going to be out in September, fascinating, uh, in, sorry, in February, a fascinating project. And uh, we were going from Yemen to London to northern Syria, so we're going into uh, Heathrow Airport, and you catch in the uh, passport line at Heathrow. And um, a man in front of me turned around, recognized me. He was a, been a reader. And he uh, said hello, and we started chatting. I says, I do. I interview people wherever I go. I said, uh, what do you do? Uh, he says, uh, my name is John Lord. I work for a company called Neodologic. I'm into software, uh, software business. I said, oh, that's really cool. I'm into technology. What, what does your software do? He says, our goal is to make every lawyer obsolete. Okay? <laughs> so... Um, Neodologic is the company's name, um, and uh, their website says that its goal is to massively improve access to advice and justice to the 40% of Americans who can't afford an attorney when they need one. Neodologic is part of a new strain of software called Expert Systems that aim to identify large chunks of businesses that clients need and that lawyers charge for, but which actually can be done by software. It's TurboTax for the legal profession. The company's website quoted one commentator complaining that Neodologic's technology cannot read between the lines or hold hands and wipe away tears. To which Neodologic posted a message underneath, you will surely see a press release when we can. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe tell the girls not to go to law school. Um, that, that might not be so productive. No problem, I picked up the Daily Beast uh, in July, and there was a story by Robert Shapiro, their economist, about um, basically uh, automation in the workplace. We all know that in the last 20 years, uh, the blue-collar manufacturing workforce in our country has fallen from 16.4 million to 11.9 million people. You know the story about the modern American textile factory. I know you've heard it. It only has two employees today, a man and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog, and the dog is there to keep the man away from the machines. That is the modern American factory today. And um, uh, Shapiro's piece reported that in this age of robotics, 
This is what's coming. Willow Garage, a robotics company, released a new personal robot that can now fold laundry and pour beer. The French firm Robotsoft showcased robots that monitor elderly patients. Italian and Swedish firms have offered robotic landscapers. A Japanese company unveiled its new robot teachers, and South Korea has developed a robot to assist firefighters and provide basic child care. Maybe tell the girls not, not to go into landscaping. Um, no problem, my, my girls are bright girls, so they can maybe go to uh, get, get, get into a good, good college. Uh, my wife's actually from Iowa. My mother-in-law uh, was chairman of the board of Grinnell College, a wonderful liberal arts college, 1,600 students in central Iowa, great, great, great school. And um, uh, maybe, maybe the girls could go there, but in 2011, uh, Grinnell College reported that 9.3% um, of all its applications came from China, and of those, 43% had perfect 800s on their math SATs. That's not UCLA, that's not Stanford, that's not UC Santa Barbara, that's Grinnell College in Central Isle. That's also the hyper-connected world. Well, no problem. Maybe the girls can at least work, uh, do some part-time work uh, in New York City, say, at Jamba Juice. Jamba Juice. They have a lot of part-time part, part -time work. I, I thought of that until I read this story in the New York Times at a Jamba Juice shop at 53rd and Lexington in Manhattan. Along with the juice and oranges, whirring blenders is another tool vital to their business, the Weather Channel. The shop's managers frequently look at the channel's website and plug in the temperature and rain forecast into the software they use to schedule employees. If the mercury is gonna hit 95 degrees the next day, the software will suggest scheduling more employees based on the historic increase in store traffic and hot weather. At the 53rd Street door of the man store, the manager says that can mean seven extra employees on a busy 11 to two shift rather than typical four or five. The program that Jamba bought in 2009 breaks down schedules into 15 minute increments using big data. So if the lunchtime rush at a particular shop slows down at 145, the software will suggest cutting 15 minutes from the shift of an employee normally scheduled from nine to two. Jamba Juice's chief, chief financial officer said the scheduling software has helped the company reduce labor costs by four or five percent a year. Maybe, maybe the girls shouldn't work at Jamba Juice. Um, no problem, they're higher aspiring. How about Google? Google. I thought, what a great place for your kids to work, but then I read on the June 13th interview in the New York Times with, Les, with, with, with Laszlo Bach, senior vice president of Google for people operations, who said, if you're looking for a job at Google, don't rest on your Ivy League laurels. The company is taking a more data-centric approach to understanding what makes for successful hires in lieu of focusing on degrees or transcripts. GPAs are now worthless, said Bach. GPAs are now worthless as a criteria for hiring, and test scores are worthless. There is no correlation at all except for brand new college grads where there's a slight correlation. This discovery has led Google to hire more people with no college degree at all. Up to 14% of some teams are now made up of people who never attended college. Bach offered some suggestions about what's wrong with higher ed. He said, I think academic environments are artificial environments. People who, are, who succeed there are sort of finely trained. They're conditioned to succeed in that environment. One of my own frustrations when I was in college and grad school is that you knew what the professor was looking for. You could figure it out, but it's much more interesting to solve problems where there isn't an obvious answer. You want people who like figuring out stuff where there's no obvious answer. Well, that may mean Google is out for the girls. What is all this telling us? It's telling us that some really big things have happened in the last seven, eight years. One thing, one good byproduct, we all know from this huge move from connected to hyper-connected, it's a world where it's great to be a consumer. How great is it to be able to get all your books now from Amazon, to even write a book on Amazon, you don't have to get a book. To get your tennis shoes from walmart.com, it's great to be a consumer now. By the way, it's gonna be great to be an innovator. You can rent time on the cloud now. As I said, for nickels and dimes from Amazon. Go on Indiegogo, find someone to help crowdsource, crowdfund your company. Great time to be an innovator. Wonderful time. Going to be a terrible time to be a leader. Because every leader today, every leader today 
is in a two-way conversation. Every leader is in a two-way conversation now. The idea of leaders who can just be in one-way conversations is completely over. It's hell on wheels now to try to lead anything. Lastly, I think the really big thing it means, and this will be the subject of the rest of my talk, the really central socioeconomic fact of all this hyper-connectivity is that average is officially over. Average is over. You know that old saying in Texas, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is all you ever got? That is N-A, no longer applicable. If all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you ever get is not all you ever got. You will get below average because every boss today, he or she now has in a hyper-connected world, cheaper, faster, easier, more efficient access to more above-average software, above-average automation, above-average cheap labor, and oh my God, above-average cheap genius. The middle class in Atlanta, in America, Minnesota, where I grew up, for 50 years was built on something called the high-wage, middle-skill job. The high-wage, middle-skill job. There is increasingly going to be no such thing as a high-wage, middle-skill job. There will only be a high-wage, high-skill job. And in a world where average is over, everyone needs to find their extra, their unique value contribution which justifies why they should be hired, why they should be retained, and why they should be promoted. So I tell my girls, girls, I'm an old fuddy-duddy. When I graduated from college, I got to find a job. You will have to invent a job. That's the big difference between us and our kids. We got to find jobs. They will have to invent them. Oh, they may get lucky and get their first job, but to retain that job, advance in that job, they will have to constantly reinvent, re-engineer, and relearn so much faster and so much more often. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, very easy for you to say, Mr. Smarty Pants, New York Times columnist. <laughs> no, let me tell you about my job, and David will really appreciate this. I became the New York Times foreign affairs columnist in January 1995. And um, I actually inherited James Reston's office in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, a great columnist and editor of the Times from the 60s and 70s, and a colleague of David's father, Anthony Lewis. Now, I suspect that Mr. Reston used to come to the office back in the 60s and 70s, that same office, and say to himself every morning, I wonder what my seven competitors are going to write today. And he personally knew all seven. I know them. I know Walter Lippmann, Mary McGrory, Stuart Alsop, Tony Lewis, Tom Wicker. I know I can name them. I do the same thing. I come to that same office every morning and say to myself, I wonder what my 70 million competitors are going to write today. <laughs> I have 70 million competitors. And I am keenly aware of that. That if I write about India, you can also read the Hindustan Times as easily as you can read my column. I'm aware of that. And what does it mean for me? Here's what it means. The New York Times last year started NewYorkTimes.com.cn, New York Times online in Chinese. We're taking the whole NewYorkTimes.com, not the whole thing, but, but parts of the NewYorkTimes.com, including blessedly my column, and we translate it every day into Chinese for our Chinese readers. Great growth project. It's currently shut down because the New York Times did report that Wen Jiaobao, the former premier's mother, is worth $2.7 billion, and the Chinese government didn't like that, and so we're currently shut down. But never mind. Um, we will be turned on, okay? And um, now, I have actually been going to China for over 20 years. And um, whenever I went to China, over these last 20 years, I had one goal in mind. One goal, one simple goal. To tell my mother-in-law in Chicago Something she didn't know about China. That was my goal. Now, as it happened, for most of those years, my mother-in-law in Chicago had never been to China. So the truth is, I could write, a, I could write an average column. Hopefully, I never did. Oh, you know, chopsticks, panda bears. I could write an average column. You know, here in China, hey, they eat with funny sticks, you know. Um, 
They said, hopefully I never did, but I could. And it would probably be my mother would say, my son-in-law, look, he's in China. Mm. When my column is in Chinese every day, do you know what that means? That means my goal now is to tell people in Chengdu something they don't know about China. Not just people in Chicago. Oh, that's a wholly different path. That is something that requires a lot more than just average. I have got to do so much more research, talk to so many more people, hopefully be so much more creative to tell someone in their own country something they don't know about their country. That's a real challenge. So average is over for me, just like everybody else. We all have to find our unique value contribution to justify why we should be hired, promoted, and advanced. I live in Bethesda, Maryland, 45 minutes from Baltimore. Who was the biggest employer in Baltimore 50 years ago? Bethlehem Steel Company. You could actually drop out of high school 50 years ago, join the steel union, get an average job at Bethlehem Steel that would enable you to buy an average home with an average yard, so you could have 2.0 average kids, an average dog, go to an average number of Baltimore Orioles baseball games, take an average number of trips to Disney World, have a perfectly average 30-year career, a wonderfully average retirement, and a perfectly average funeral. What is the biggest employer in Baltimore today? Bethlehem Steel is long gone. The biggest employer in Baltimore today is Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. They do not let you cut the grass there without a BA, okay? <laughs> All right. I exaggerate, but they certainly probably don't let you cut the grass there without some kind of post-secondary education. So what's basically going on in the labor market? What's going on, and I think this is underlying everything you're doing here, is our labor market historically was divided into three tiers. The top tier was called non-routine work. Everyone wants to be non-routine or have their kids be non-routine. Non-routine work is work that uh, cannot be described by an algorithm and therefore outsourced, automated, or digitized. It's work that requires creative thinking, uh, collaboration, and communication, and problem solving. It's being a scientist, an engineer, a draftsman, um, a teacher, a professor, a singer, a songwriter, uh, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant. All those are considered non-routine work. We all want to be non-routine, maybe even journalists, okay? Second tier is called routine work. That, that was work that either was in a factory that required repetitive motion or in the back room of a company that really didn't require problem solving but more moving numbers around. N routine work today has been crushed being crushed by robotics and manufacturing, and it's being crushed by software in the backs of banks and insurance companies. You don't want to be doing anything that can be described by an algorithm and therefore outsourced, automated, or digitized. Third category is non-routine local work. This is work that has to be done face-to-face -face in a specific location. So that's your dental hygienist, your dentist, your butcher, your baker, your candlestick maker, your massage therapist, your divorce lawyer. Work that has to be done in a specific place, face to face. But you need to know that the wages of your non-routine workers in Atlanta will depend in part by the number of high-end workers you have. It's much better to be a massage therapist um, in Buckhead than it is in Buckhead, Montana. Okay? So that is historically what the labor market looked like and what's been happening. Now, basically, as I say, what's been happening is that the middle tier has been crushed. That's basically what's happening. The middle tier is being crushed. It's not enough anymore even, we know the middle tier has been crushed, but here's the new, new thing. It's not enough anymore even to say, I'm a journalist, <clears throat> I'm non-routine, I'm safe. The Wall Street Journal now, uh, Reuters, they have a whole army of journalists in India who now do what I used to do when I started as a beginning journalist, write up company reports. It's all done from over there. Not enough, I'm a columnist, I'm non-routine. Not when you can read every columnist in the world. 
I need to be a creative columnist. You need to be creative non-routine now. You need to bring something extra. Not enough to say, I'm a radiologist, I'm non-routine. No, not when I can get my x-rays read in Bangalore, just as easily as in Atlanta. You've got to be a creative radiologist. Not enough to say, I'm a lawyer, I'm non-routine. No, you better be a creative lawyer. Not enough to say, I'm an accountant, I'm non-routine. No, you better be a creative accountant. Well, not a creative accountant, but you know what I mean. We've, <laughs> we've had enough of those, but I mean, it's... Um, Everybody has to define their extra, that unique value contribution. When I was writing this book, I interviewed a banker down in Dallas, and he said something that just really stuck in my mind. He said, Tom, today you only hire someone if you absolutely have to. And that was in 2008, during the subprime crisis. But I tell you, that has not gone away, and I don't think it is going away. The challenge for all of us is to make ourselves someone who has to be hired and has to be promoted. So what does it mean for education? It's really, I think, central to your enterprise here. What it means is I think we have three educational challenges today. The first is we have to bring our bottom to our average so much faster. Because we have so many young people from disadvantaged neighborhoods who aren't even finishing high school. And in a world today, in a hyper-connected world, if you don't finish high school, if you don't have some form of post-secondary education, there is nothing down there for you. There is nothing down there that will sustain an average lifestyle. Now that's about more of the three R's, more reading, writing, and arithmetic. Our second challenge, though, is we need to bring our average to the global heights so much higher. To have more people who can truly be innovators, and that's about what my friend Tony Wagner and your speaker this morning calls the three C's, creativity, communication, and collaboration. As Tony, who is a real teacher of mine, says it's not enough to graduate young people college ready. They've got to be innovation ready. That's got to be our goal. To bring something extra to whatever they do, whether it's a blue collar or a white collar job. Ellen Coleman, the president of DuPont, CEO of DuPont told me when we were working on this job about the world of blue-collar work, she said, I need every worker present today. I need every worker thinking about whatever's coming down the line. Where can we fork off there? How can we fix this? How can we improve that in a hyper-connected world? I need every worker thinking of herself or himself as an innovator. But the third challenge we have, I think, is going to be about motivation. Motivation becomes so much more important, I should say, self-motivation becomes so much more important in a hyper-connected world. Because, you know, the good news, the really good news, for all the reasons I've described, is that the walls and the ceilings are gone. The walls and the ceilings are gone. If you have an idea now, you can act on it so much farther, faster, cheaper, easier than ever before. But the floors are gone too. So we've blown away the walls and the ceilings, but we've blown away the floors. And so this world, where everything now is out there, on the web, on the cloud, with easy access, those who reach for it are going to have such an advantage of the, over those who don't. And here is what's really scary. Scary to me someone who cares deeply about our society. We are now in a 401k world where everyone has to pass the bar and everyone will face the most email list. What do I mean? I mean that for the last 60 years when we lived in a world of walls, if there were a meter on the world, the meter was set over to the left. There's a world of unions, a world of closed markets, and that meter said, you live in a world of defined benefits. You work here at Bethlehem Steel for 30 years, this is your benefit. You will get this whether you work harder, less hard, more above average, less above average. Basically, we lived in a world of defined benefits. When the world got hyper-connected, that meter shifted over here. This is where we are now. We're in a 401k world, and the meter says, you live now in a world of defined contributions. Our kids going forward 
we'll live in a world where their return is going to be so much more directly related to their contribution. And in a world of big data, the folks at Jamba Juice know just who sold the most juice between 11 and 2 p.m. at their store at 53rd and Lexington. At the same time, everyone will have to pass the bar. What is the bar? Well, think about the legal profession. For whatever reason, the legal profession decided long ago, before other professions, most of many other professions, that just getting a law degree was no longer a proxy for your ability to practice law. So the legal profession invented the bar exam. They said, great, you've gone to law school, but now you've got to pass this bar exam before we actually let you practice law. The bar exam is coming to an industry or job near you. Because what happened when the world got hyper-connected is a huge gap has opened up between industry and education. Schools cannot educate people fast enough for the skills being demanded by business. So the biggest, one of the biggest explosive industries in sort of the jobs world is people creating tests, bar exams, for almost every single career. You want to get a job at Google now? You have to take three levels of exams. Not only do they not care that you went to school, they believe in another of Tony Wagner's dictums. The world doesn't care what you know because the Google machine knows everything. <laughs> the world only pays off on what you do with what you know. And everyone is now going to be testing what can you do with what you know. So that's kind of how I see the impact of the hyper-connected world on jobs and education. Let me conclude by preempting the first question, which is, what do you tell your kids? Before I do, let me just assure you of one thing. I'm a journalist and an author. I get very excited about connecting dots and giving people larger frameworks to think about things. I may be right, I may be wrong. But do not confuse my enthusiasm for describing these connections for approval or disapproval, for that matter. I'm, I live by the philosophy that unless we as a country understand every day what are the biggest trends out there in the world, how do we align ourselves with those trends so more of our citizens and young people can be empowered with the tools to realize their full potential in this world, then we are going to be one very unhappy country. And so that's really what motivates me to do what I do. But do not confuse my enthusiasm for anything being other than net worried about a lot of these trends, their impact on society, and most of all, our government that does not wake up every day and ask, what world are we living in? but is now populated by two warring tribes who wake up every day trying to figure out how they can subvert the other. We cannot keep doing that. So, um, no, I'm not done. So, let me conclude, as I said, by just preempting the first question, which is, what do you tell your kids? What do you tell your own kids? Why well, five sort of generic piece of advice for my, my girls, and they are very quickly, think like an immigrant, think like an artisan, think like a starter-upper in Silicon Valley. Remember that PQ plus CQ is always greater than IQ, and always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis, my favorite restaurant. Okay. <laughs> so let me explain. First of all, think like an immigrant. How does the new immigrant think? How does the new immigrant? The new immigrant says, I just showed up here in Atlanta, and there is no legacy spot waiting for me at Georgia Tech. I better figure out what's going on here. Understand where the biggest opportunities are and pursue them with more energy and vigor than anybody else. An Armenian friend of mine always likes to say, immigrants are paranoid optimists. Okay? <laughs> They're optimists because they picked up somewhere bad and came somewhere they thought would be better, and they are paranoid because they think it can be taken away from them at any moment. Friends, think like an immigrant because we are all new immigrants today to the hyper-connected world. We're all on a journey. 
Second, think like an artisan. This is an idea I got from Larry Katz at Harvard, great labor economist. You know, Larry likes to say, well, who was the artisan? Who was the art? Artisan was that person in the Middle Ages, before factories, before mass manufacturing, who made every item one-off, every item individually. They made every plate, every utensil, every table, every pair of shoes, every saddle, every stirrup, every chandelier, every piece of furniture the artisan made individually. And what did the best artisans do? The best artisans brought so much extra to their work. They brought so much extra, they carved their initials into it. Do your job every day as if at the end of the day you'd want to carve your initials into it. Think like an artisan. Third, think like a starter-upper in Silicon Valley. This is an idea I got from Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn. Reid, as I say, in Silicon Valley, there's only one four-letter word. It starts with F, but actually it isn't four letters. And that word is finished. Finished. If you ever think you're finished, Silicon Valley, you are really finished. Reed's motto is always be in beta. Always think of yourself as a piece of software or technology in beta. What is the stage of beta? Beta is the stage in a piece of software or technology when it's about 85%, 90% done, and they throw it over the wall. They let the community test it, find the gaps, the holes, the flaws. They throw it back. You work on it some more. You throw it over the wall again. Always be in beta. Always think of yourself as a work in progress. Always think of yourself as someone engineering, re-engineering, and relearning. I do believe Alvin Toffler was right when he said the new literacy today is not reading and writing. It's the ability to learn and relearn. That is the new literacy in a hyper-connected world. Fourth, PQ plus CQ is always greater than, I, greater than IQ. That is one of my life models. You give me a young person today in a world where everything is out there, who has a high passion quotient and a high curiosity quotient, and I'll take them over the kid with a high intelligence quotient seven days a week, okay? PQ plus CQ is always greater than IQ in the hyper-connected world. And lastly, Think like an artisan, sorry, think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House. So I'm working on this book. I'm back home. I'm having breakfast on a Sunday morning with my best friend, Ken, at Perkins, my favorite restaurant, France Avenue and Highway 100, if those of you have been to Minneapolis know. I ordered three buttermilk pancakes and scrambled eggs. Ken ordered three buttermilk pancakes and fruit. And after 15 minutes, the waitress came. She put our two plates down. All she said to Ken was, I gave you extra fruit. That's all she said. She got a 50% tip. <laughs> Why? Because that waitress didn't control much. But she controlled the fruit ladle. <laughs> all right. And that was the source of her extra. What was she doing in her own little world, that waitress? She was thinking entrepreneurially, whatever you do, whatever job you're in, be relentlessly entrepreneurial, always looking for the new opportunity, the new business, the new edge, the new angle. So friends, if you take nothing else from this talk, please take this. Think like an immigrant, stay hungry. Think like an artisan, take pride. Think like a starter-upper in Silicon Valley and always be in beta. Remember that PQ plus CQ is always greater than IQ. And think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House. And always think entrepreneurially. Because we all now, as this Minnesota boy can tell you, live in Garrison Keeler's Lake Wobegon, <laughs> where all the men are strong, all the women are beautiful, and all the children need to be above average. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a very few extra minutes that Tom has been very generous to Thank give you. us for questions. We have microphones on either side.
I'll try the to. The questions, Tom has to catch an airplane, so the questions need to be short. Also, there are a lot of people who would love to ask questions, so please don't make speeches. You're taking time away from everyone else, and Tom Thanks, will leave you. faster. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, where are the microphones? Here. And is anybody? Oh, no. uh, go ahead, please. Yeah. It's not working. Oh, there we go. My, My question for you relates to emerging democracies and global economies. Uh, with regards to Iran, given what we know about their population, their education, the number of them under 30, and how unhappy they are as a population, what would you say to America about what the U.S. policy should be towards Iran, and should the president meet with the president Ruhani. of Iran? Yeah, um, I'm going to meet with him this week. I'm looking forward to it. Um, uh, so Iran, you know, I, I would simply say this. I, I think that um, uh, the president's really been on the right track um, on Iran in, in this sense. Um, uh, I, I do think the question of Iran getting nuclear weapons, um, that that is a bad thing. It's a bad thing because um, it will trigger Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan uh, and everybody else in the Middle East to also want to get a nuclear weapon. And that will lead to the end of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. And that is something that actually does affect us. You can be sad about Syria or unsad about Syria. It's hard to make a case that what happens in Syria affects people here in Atlanta. What happens with Iran does affect people. Now, I think President Obama has shown a lot of patience, a lot of wisdom by imposing the sanctions regime. And the reason President Rouhani is here, think about just his election. The Iranian regime allowed eight people, eight men to run, eight men to run, okay? Um, they were Mr. Black, 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 Mr. Light Gray. <laughs> and all the Iranian people voted for Mr. Light Gray. That tells you something. It tells you what they want. And it tells you why Mr. Light Gray is now here on a charm offensive. So I, I think that, um, uh, I hope that he is ready to deal, and I hope that we are ready to deal. I would hate to see it resolved in any other way. It'd be bad for Iran and bad for us. I think there is, is an opportunity uh, going forward. But, you know, I've just been finished a project, uh, a documentary that'll appear on Showtime in February uh, on uh, climate environment issues in the Arab Spring, and I wrote about it a little this Sunday in my column, because there's kind of this feeling in the Middle East that, um, well, in Egypt, it's either the Muslim Brotherhood or the military. In Iran, it's either the pragmatists or the ideologues, you know, and it's kind of, and if you'd gone to sleep, as I said, 30 years ago, and you woke up last week, you think, same story. It's the Muslim Brotherhood or the military. It's the pragmatists or the ideologues. Well, guess what? There, as Princess Di once said, there are three people in my marriage, okay? Um, there's now a few, there's someone else in this marriage, okay? And she's called Mother Nature. Um, all these countries, Iran's population has gone from 37 million to 85 million since the Khomeini came to power. Egypt's gone from 40 million to 85 million. They're all suffering water shortage, climate, environmental stresses of catastrophic degree, potentially catastrophic degree, I should say. And um, if they don't, um, Mother Nature is going to have her say. And my friend and teacher, Rob Watson, the inventor of Green Buildings, always liked to say, you know, Mother Nature, she's just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. You can't say, Mother Nature, we're having an Arab awakening. Could you take a few years off? We're having a subprime crisis. Could you take a few? Mother Nature will do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. And the thing about Mother Nature, she always bats last. And she always bats a thousand. Do not mess with Mother Nature. <laughs> and I tell you, in the next 40 years, there are going to be three people in this marriage. Actually, there's a fourth, but I don't have time for that. And, and that's the emergent rising middle classes. And they are going to define this region much more than the old, you know, Muslim Brotherhood military. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, like, the last seven years, how things have changed and how technology has advanced. What do you see in the next seven years? What are the next, we believe, the most important technological in innovations that will hit in the next seven years? You know, it's hard, it's hard to predict, but, you know, let me just say something I think is very relevant for your community here. Um, and it also ties up with the young lady's question over here. Um, and, and that is that I think the world of developed and developing countries is over. That was, very, that was for the round world, okay? Um, 
in the hyper-connected world, there are just going to be two kind of countries, in my view. Um, and there will be HIEs and LIEs. By the way, there will only be two kind of communities. HIEs or LIEs. High imagination enabling countries or communities and low imagination enabling countries and communities. Because in this hyper-connected world now, if I just have the spark of an idea, just the spark of an idea, I can actually go to Delta in Taiwan, my friend Bruce Younger, he will actually design this for me. I can skip over to Alibaba in Hangzhou, and my pal Jack Ma will line up 30 cheap Chinese manufacturers to make this. I then jump over to Seattle, my buddy Jeff Bezos will do my fulfillment and delivery and gift wrap it for you for Christmas. I can go to freelancer.com to get someone to do my logo for $18.95, unless someone bids $17.95. And I can go to Craigslist to get my accountant. They're all commodities now, except this. And you want Atlanta and we want America to be the highest imagination enabling community and society you can be. Because all net new jobs now come from startups. The day when Ford Motor is going to come to Atlanta and say, we're here in Atlanta now, we've got 25,000 jobs. That's over. They've got 2,500 robots and maybe 2,500 jobs. So what we need is three people in Atlanta inventing jobs for seven. Seven inventing jobs for 20. 20 inventing jobs for 50. That's how we're going to get those 25,000 jobs. And that's what I mean when I say you need to be relentlessly entrepreneurial. You want to, your brand to the world, you want is what every city I go to want. We are the highest imagination enabling city in the South or in America or in the world. And you want to make sure as a country, that's what we are. If we were actually having a real debate today, it wouldn't be about the debt ceiling and putting a bullet in the head of our credit rating. It would be about how we as a country become the highest imagination enabling society in the world. And I know one thing. I don't know whether Obamacare is perfect or not perfect or whatever. I'm sure it, there's plenty of things that could be fixed about it. But if we don't have a health care safety net in a world where individuals are going to be out there freelancing more and more, bad things are going to happen. So, um, <laughs> take one more. Yeah. Since one of your earlier books was written, the world's gotten a lot hotter, a lot flatter, and a yes. lot more crowded. Um, in, the, in that same time, our government has firmly entrenched their heads further into the, stand, <laughs> into the sand. What responsibility does our government play, and we as the electors of the people in our government, in making America great as part of this next generation? Well, thank you for that question. It's a very good and important question. And fortunately, you're all too correct that um, uh, you know, the climate debate, uh, and here I've, I've been critical of the president because unfortunately um, uh, the climate deniers have been really busy these last six, seven years. And, um, uh, and unfortunately, because it was deemed not good politics, there has not been enough pushback by the president and his team uh, to really counter this trend. And, and uh, so those of us who care about it are on our heels. Um, I just see very quickly my approach to it is very simple. I did write a book called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. And if I had it here, I'd hold it up to the to this great audience, and I would say hot, flat, and crowded. Well, you know, the hot is about global warming and all that. And um, maybe you don't believe in hot. Maybe you don't believe in hot. Anybody got an eraser? Let's take hot off, okay? You don't believe in hot? That's between you and your beach house, okay? I believe in hot, but okay, <laughs> that's going to be between you and your beach house. But here's what you better believe. You better believe in flat and crowded. You better believe the world is getting flatter with more and more people who aspire to, who see how we live, aspire to live like we live, to drive American-sized cars on American-sized roads, live in American-sized houses, eating American-sized Big Macs. And in a world with more and more people, and more of them able and aspiring to live like Americans, just that alone, forget hot, will tip this world toward more environmental destruction and degradation faster than any time in history. What that means to me is something very simple, which is that the next great global industry has to be, absolutely has to be, otherwise we are a bad biological experiment. The next great global industry has to be clean water, clean energy, energy efficiency, and clean power, all of those things. 
and therefore forget about hot, you don't believe that, no problem. But don't tell me you don't want to lead the world in what's going to be the next great global industry. So that's how I kind of try to turn the argument on the people, on the flat earthers, the wrong kind of flat earthers. Um, I, I got to go, unfortunately, to uh, connect a, uh, to a flight, but this has been fantastic. I'm so excited about what you're doing, and thank you for having me here today. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for the thank you.